The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Gracious and Holy One who is exalted on high, God of gods and Lord of lords, to whom alone belongs all power, honor, glory, and dominion, who alone is worthy of all worship, to whom alone our allegiance belongs, we bless your name that you are our God and our Savior. <coughs> Thank you for Christ, who has redeemed us and reconciled us to you, who is our priest and mediator, that we may come unto you. We thank you for your spirit who uh, indwells us and is sanctifying us, but also is our teacher and will open the word to us, Lord. We pray you give us indeed teachable uh, hearts as we would come to study what your word has to say about worship, that we might uh, learn well together. And when we disagree, that we would do so with gentleness and humility. Give us of our sins. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. All right. <coughs> we'll see, Sean just always leads the class, doesn't he? All right, Sean's here, David's here, uh, Nichols. Uh, Felipe, how, how's your wife? She's doing fine, sir. She's so good. You never got back to me, but I assume she was fine. Yeah, she's really nauseated, but it's part That's of good. the package, right? That is good. That's always a good sign. Yeah. Just keep telling her that. It's a good sign. <laughs> well, she would disagree with you, but... <laughs> well, it just means her hormones are raging. That's why it's a good sign. Miguel's here. Zach. Jeremiah Horner. Good to see you now. That's good. Auditing. So you the first auditor. All right. And Joshua Horner, the Horner twins, huh? Joshua Horner. Horner. Come in. Joshua Horner. Is he doing it online or no? Oh. He's the elder in Tennessee. He might yeah. be doing it online. It doesn't say that. <coughs> We're not online, so that could uh -huh. be problematic. Okay. Uh, somebody just said. You there, Joshua? Yeah, I just got Togro right now. Yeah. I've got my techie guy here. So. Yeah, do that. He maybe didn't get the message that we were changing the time. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Zachary Jaquette. Where are you from? Uh, from Greenville. Oh, from Greenville. Just a good French person from Greenville. <laughs> You go to Bob Jones? Yes, sir. All right. You're welcome. Uh, Timothy here. and his bride. Her name didn't get in here. That's why I was wondering what happened to y'all. Uh, John Mormon, they get back from lunch? Yep, they did. John Nyman. Yes. All these Johns. <laughs> Corey, I saw you somewhere. There you are. Mateus. Ken. Uh, Thomas Rolf, he's the last one we were waiting for, right? Yep. From Virginia. Torbrell is online. Um, Henny Verdonk, did I pronounce that correctly? Call me Sam. Okay, Sam, well that's in your email, so I'm probably... Mr. Vogel, we've got a large Canadian contingency there, we don't know. So he's always the last in the class. It's a shame that he has to be there. Anybody whose name I did not call? Adam Christopher. Hi, Adam. How's it going? I'm good. But I don't know how you didn't get registered. I also didn't get the email about the time change. Uh, I did pay, so. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter about the time change. I don't know why you're not even populated. Don't leave me out. Do everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you raise that? <laughs> Very good. Now, a second question. How many of you, uh, I've got a lot of uh, newer students in here, which is fine with me, but how many of you would really be third-year students and have done your Hebrew? Uh, 
I don't want to answer that. <laughs> I know you're struggling. All right. <laughs> Raise your hands again. Send boldly. Come on. All right, because I have to know who to who has to do that extra work. Don't duck that head down back there. You get that head up. <laughs> supposed to be by now well adapted in your Hebrew, so I want you to be a real encouragement to these other people. Right, Mr. Dawson? I went to public school in Appalachia. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Corey did too, so we'll see. <laughs> what an answer. Yeah. Why don't we hear this weekend that it's intelligence, then there's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. So... Gotta have all four. <laughs> well, we want all four, don't we? I sent uh, Josh a text. I'll let you know if I can. Thank you, Zach. You may join us if you want to. I would like to, but I have to work for you downstairs. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's probably good as well. Everybody has this down. Did you get this down? Michael. Is it Michael? <coughs> all right. So we can get rid of it if I do not. <clears throat> Just a save document. Very good. <clears throat> now, Tess, if I click that, I, I'm not going to lose him, am I? No. Okay. Because it was in my way. So, everybody access this off of Populi? All right. The course purpose is for the class to articulate what covenantal worship is, to develop its principles from Scripture, to trace its development in history, and to apply <coughs> the principles to the preparation and leading of worship. So, you, basically, we've got three sections. So, we're going to lay an exegetic and theological foundation for what we are wanting to do. Um, and then in, as we try to develop the principles, we'll do a little bit with history in connection to that. Um, and then, uh, so that's all the first part, the theology, the preparation then of worship, uh, and then the leading of worship. And then that uh, last class uh, is very useful that Michael Spengler does, uh, particularly on how to lead singing, but he's, uh, he's added a few more things to that this year, plus that excellent piece out of uh, Calvin's uh, form of prayer. So some of these things are always the same in my courses, uh, but the first three or four are five, six. <laughs> Actually, all of these are more pertinent for this course. So to understand the meaning and purpose of covenantal worship, to state and defend the regulative principle, to apply that principle, to determine the appropriate elements of New Testament worship, to defend the other principles of covenantal worship, to trace the history of worship from the New Testament to present day. A lot depends at that point where we are uh, in terms, because I, I like I have a lot of discussion, took them as front end, so um, we might not do a lot with that. Uh, we'll just see. Uh, but we will relate that to uh, liturgy and the preparation of worship and then uh, leading worship according to these uh, principles. So uh, in uh, full print are the required books. I think all of these are downstairs. Some of you had difficulty getting some things uh, online. Um, the, uh, the Lachman book, and I guess it's the Van Doren book that uh, people had trouble with, but we should have these. We have these downstairs? We do, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this is great. Even if he has Dutch Canadian reform. No, it really is. It's, 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 it's remarkable. So, um, but the suggested books, we'll come back to some of them in particular. Um, 
So then you've got that sp special assignment for um, <coughs> Friday. Uh, now I'm assuming he's changed that a bit with the new syllabus. I probably didn't bring that into line with what he sent you there, but his assignments are in there. Who sent us what? It's in the bottom of the of the, of the new syllabus. It's in Populate. It's lesson 14. It's just. One of the reasons we reached and I did make some additions to to the syllabus, but also so you'd have his corrected, uh, expanded uh, lesson 14. All right, <coughs> other responsibilities. Uh, these will be due 5 p.m. on May 8th. And uh, this first part is 20% of your grade. Each of the parts are 4% each, a morning service, a baptism service, communion service, funeral service, and wedding service. But now pay attention. I mean, you really think graduate students would do a better job. Anyway, you guys are going to surprise me, I'm sure, and do, do well. Do you know what, if you don't, Sean will explain it to you, what bulletin ready means? I do a bulletin every week. I can imagine your bulletin, though, is not has much in it. So It doesn't. That's <laughs> the beauty of it. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of them are like uh, the Friday shopping guy that comes in the mail. But anyway, uh, that means I want psalm and hymn selection, scripture readings, call to worship, uh, if used, common prayer, uh, if you uh, have colics to be written out, communion, and these terms will get defined for you. <coughs> the communion and baptism service are to be the entire service, not repeating what you have under the morning service, but a Another worship service uh, that would have every, all of this plus the text of the sermon. Um, and then your liturgy for baptism, at least in a very good outline form. Uh, do you want to write it out? That's good. Same for communion, uh, funeral, both graveside and memorial, wedding service. So you'll get examples of all these things as well. Any questions about that? So that's just... Uh, Save this on your computer, and when you are like Zach, and you've got this responsibility, then you've got the form all laid out there for you. I trust it's a better form than he has. Maybe. Don't use forms. You don't? No, sir. Even though the standards say to use forms. That's, I thought you were a strict subscription. Well, Dr. Piper, I think we could disagree on what the standards <laughs> may or may not say on this particular juncture. We will talk about forms, Lord willing, tomorrow morning. All right, now I want two reflection papers on two books. I used to be three, but it's two books. Burroughs' Gospel Worship and uh, Miller's Thoughts on Public Prayer. Five to seven pages each. What I want you to do in that is let me see from that that you have been through the book and got the general principles, and then you may interact with the book um, as you wish as well. Minimum of five pages. Don't go over seven. That's also due 5 o'clock, May 8th. And then a critical evaluation of a book on worship uh, from a selected list. That'd be about seven to eight pages. So uh, we can talk about this, but you know, Jeff Myers, uh, Frame, uh, Gore, any of these, um, Mr. Dawson is very welcome to do a critical review of a book that's anti uh, exclusive psalmody, or you may do a book that is pro-exclusive psalmody. Uh, a number of books in the bibliography, look at those. You know of others that's not been uh, brought up to date yet. Uh, so just let me know. You can do the same book. That doesn't matter. That somebody else is doing. I really recommend, uh, in terms of timeliness, either Gore or Myers. Uh, Gore's, uh, a bit surprising, was a PhD dissertation at uh, Westminster, where he says that we've misunderstood Calvin, and I can tell you, the friend, I think he has misunderstood Calvin. But anyway, um, that got a PhD, so it's surely worth interacting with. Uh, uh, Jeff Meyer's book on uh, basically the principles of that have come out of that more um, federal vision uh, type approach to worship, covenant renewal, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. So, uh, frame, now I've got a bit of a review here, I wouldn't want you to 
take that. If you want to deal with frame or Slissel's papers downstairs, you may do that. Sean? Um, I apologize for the ignorant question, but uh, the list of books that you're referencing now, is is this a list somewhere that we find or we just go No, I said it's not a list. Go to the bibliography. It's my fault it's not a list, but go to the bibliography. Um, and there's some in there, but you might be another book that you're aware of that you want to uh, interact with as well. The standards, okay, you can take the directory of worship. And <laughs> it's just there. <laughs> and these were like words, I guess is the million dollar question. It does, doesn't it say that? Well, I mean, I, what it means though is... Oh. Good. Zach and I have a long-term love relationship, okay? <laughs> he says I'm one of his two favorite professors. He ran the other one off, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. No. So we will joke, but I have a great <coughs> respect for him. And as you'll see, for his position as well, it's often caricatured and should not be. It is challenging. <coughs> so, uh, critical evaluation, that's not a book review now, this is where I really want you to, here's the author's thesis, here's his arguments, here's why I reject them. There'll be an examination, and that should be January 24th in the morning. Uh, try to get it, give you a, a week to read after the course to go over your notes. Um, now, catechism memorization, you got there what I'm going to want you to memorize. So this will be due during the next three months. By 5 p.m. on the dates or in the syllabus. Now, I need to warn you. I think that pay attention to these dates. I did not have the time to go into the daily, uh, the hourly lesson plan and change those dates. These are the uh, canonical dates for your catechism. Right here on two pages in the syllabus. And uh, I think they're highlighted for you. Uh, so, um, you see uh, January the 6th, that's for today. I hope you've got that done, but you've got until January 31st to do that. And then it's just a, a, a regular <coughs> week after that for each one, February 7th, <coughs> 14th, uh, <coughs> 21st. 28th, March 6th, jumps to March 27th. We've got a nice hiatus in there. Uh, April 3rd, April 10th, April 17th, April 24th, May 1st, May 8th. Now, most of you, no, some of you, a good number of you have had my approach to catechism, which actually has become even more gracious. Um, you are to do this on your own. Uh, you don't have to memorize the question, but write out the answer from memory and then you check yourself. I'm not worried about spelling or grammar, but I am worried about exact words. Um, you may miss one word, and that's still an A. Two words, an A minus, three words, you just go down the ladder. What I've, I've changed, and then I got this from listening to one of Dr. Smith's lectures in IRT, is that your first pass in that, you don't have to send that in. So. Uh, you miss more than you want to, you review some more, you take it again. As long as it's in to Miss Holmes by 5 p.m. on the day stated, you can take it as many times as you want to, you're perfect. Now that's good for you because you're also going to see these things on the examination. Well, you can't see them in the examination, can you? Because examination is um, uh, before. So anyway, you're spared that. But it's just good because it will help you with your presbytery exams. Uh, and so, you're teaching your children, whatever. All right, any question about catechism? So, you grade it yourself, and then you notice you'll send it to Mrs. Holmes <coughs> at that email address. That, along with your class discussion, is going to be about 20% of your grade as well. I want your exams. And written assignments, what you send to me to be in Microsoft Word. If some of you got that strange foreign computer with an apple in the front of it, you just have to learn how to get that saved appropriately. Um, but don't send it to me PDF, though, because what I'll 
I'm trying to do is make this easy on you and me. You can't read my writing if I have to write, and you can read my typing normally. And so uh, I'll type in uh, responses and such. So it's going to save me a lot of time. But now notice again, and it's amazing our graduate students just miss this. It's to come to me at my Gmail account. Actually, it's not in your syllabus. It's in the other syllabi. Um, Joseph.pipa at gmail.com. You see that? That's my non-cluttered account. If you send it to the J. Piper address, it's with 50 other daily emails, most of which just get a very quick delete. Uh, and you might inadvertently get deleted. So send it to the Gmail account. Do not send it to Mrs. Holmes for her to send to me either. Okay, send them to me, not your catechism, but on the 8th, well, on, after you take your exam, which also, um, we want, I want you to take your exam uh, in Microsoft Word, um, unless you really have trouble with English as a second language or uh, typing or something. So you'll, those of you that are uh, up in the cold north, we'll simply arrange for a uh, um, proctor, and uh, Mrs. Holmes will send that proctor to you at the uh, arranged time. You don't have to wait until the morning of the 24th. You can fit it into your schedule. And if, in fact, because of your winter schedule, you really need to take it a bit later, that's fine with me as, as well. I've just done it this way, so those of you that are going to take courses second semester, you know, give yourself a bit of breathing room as you go into the uh, into second uh, semester. All right, the uh, <coughs> one unexcused absence was a three-hour module will result in your grade being lowered one letter, two, two letters, three, failure. Uh, request for an excuse need to be made by phone, text, or email. Uh, and if email or text not acknowledged, then call. If because of an emergency you're unable to contact me before class, let me know as soon as possible the nature of the emergency after the class. I do not want you on the internet or web during class unless I've asked you to look up something. On approved late assignments, we will receive an automatic F. Approved late assignments will be penalized according to the student handbook. And there's my phone and my... Um, you may call me. Just don't call me after, say, 8 o'clock at night. My stated bedtime is 8.30 because my stated get-up time is 4.30. I rarely ever am in bed at 8.30, but it's a nice goal. Mm -hmm. If you call me at 8.30, I'm not going to make it for sure. Mm -hmm. I might be a bit grumpy. So uh, disrespect that. Other times, call me anytime you want to. I see hands. I thought I saw hands. No? Scratching your heads. No? Just scratching my head. A lot of information. I thought you had a different Gmail account, too. No. I thought it was Joseph the Sacred Desk Piper. <laughs> no, that's, that's uh, Jim McCarty. Oh. Oh. A birdie told me to mention <coughs> that to you. Well, that's Jim. Yeah, we give Jim a hard time about the Sacred Desk. This is the Sacred Desk. All right. So here, Lord willing, is the map. <coughs> so this evening, um, and actually... I'm going to try to get a good bit ahead of this. So I'd like to get through, uh, up through John uh, 4 tonight, even though most of you have not read it. But if we don't, we're going to get here very early. Uh, and second, um, that crowds, uh, crowds the week. So uh, has anybody read ahead after, uh, like, read Exodus 20 on the regular principle of worship? I translated from Exodus 20. Well, good for you. I translated also. Good. Well, maybe we'll at least get that far. Uh, but since I want to do this by discussion, and that is my fault for the way the syllabus is uh, laid out, um, I guess normally this class we've only met about an hour and a half or two hours on the first day. But the syllabus initially had three hours, didn't it? Are we supposed to translate John 4? Yeah. You can get that done, too. Where is it? 
Where does it say that? I didn't see it. But it know. says January 7th, translate John 4, <coughs> 20 to 26, lesson 3. Need our translations to use, sir? No, we'll just go. We're you're going to do it in class. We'll just rotate around and let you okay. do it in class so we can talk about it that way. So. Did you find it yet, Zach? Uh, I'm looking at January 7th. Lesson 3, Rule of Worship. Chapter oh, yeah, 3. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm, my bad. Well, thank you. Public, public Education in Appalachia. Your reading skills are pretty good. I've been reading Heidegger, by the way. I really like him. Yeah, I, I've read a vast chunk of him. I wish, I wish it was more on the sacraments. I had some questions. Yeah. About, but anyway. Yeah. Well, I wish we had the granddaddy and not the... The medulla, the actual... Yeah. Because yeah. in the sacraments, it's all referring to... I've said this before, but you go back and look. You did say this, but flame on worship. I've already stated this, and you go back and look, and no, he hasn't stated it, so... Anyway, we're really blessed that there's a lot of, of Reformed scholasticism that's coming into translation, and I just encourage you to read it. It's very profitable. I just finished the preface for Perkins, uh, volume 10, which that's the last volume, and that's a, it's such a gift of God of the Church to have William Perkins, all 10 volumes, into uh, a modern English. You can profitably spend the next year just reading Perkins. All right. Any other questions or comments? Very good. So, <clears throat> I call this covenantal worship, uh, even though the course description, I think, calls it reformed worship. Uh, I should change that in the catalog. For two reasons. I'm not claiming for this to be the last word on what a reformed approach to worship is, and so uh, I've said to avoid that term. But secondly, as you will see early on, I'm seeking to develop worship in terms of our covenant relationship and response uh, to God. Now, if you haven't had your head in the sand or been in the Appalachians for the last few years, uh, you know the importance of this topic, particularly in our Reformation uh, traditional churches. Calvin emphasized the importance. I have also a difficulty conceding to you that there is nothing more perilous to our salvation than a distorted and perverse <coughs> worship of God. Primary rudiments by which we want to train those whom we wish to win as disciples to Christ are these, not to frame any new worship of God for themselves at random or their pleasure, but to know that the only legitimate worship is that which he himself Proved from the beginning. Now, isn't that interesting? How are we going to train uh, people as disciples? But they shouldn't frame a worship for themselves, but they are to know the only legitimate worship is that which God Himself has approved <coughs> from the beginning. That's in his reply to Sadalet when he been exiled from Geneva. Um, Sadalet then writes, trying to get the Genevan fathers to bring the church back into Rome, and so they write the banished Calvin uh, to reply to Sadalet. And with that, he got that invitation he didn't want, and that was to return to Geneva as well. And he felt compelled, as he did the first time, uh, to go back. The necessity of reforming the church is actually more startling if it be inquired then by what things chiefly the Christian religion has sustained in existence amongst us and maintains its truth be found in the following two. Now, if you were asked that question, what would you say first? The two things uh, by which Christian religion has sustained in existence among us and maintains its truth. Questions: How Christianity sustains its existence? I'd say the sustaining of the Word of God. What's the most important thing a person needs to know um, to know true Christianity? I would have said justification, how a sinner's right with God. But notice what Calvin puts first. Um, first, the mode in which God is duly worshipped, and second, the source from which salvation is to be obtained, which is Christ. Mm -hmm. So he understood 
that the whole approach to worship is bound up in the fear of God. And uh, without, in Calvin's mind, without faithful biblical worship, there would be an awful declension of Christianity. And that's what we're seeing today. So it is important. Now, its timelessness uh, is testified to by the great flux that's occurring in our churches and denominations with drama, dances, choruses, and all kinds of other innovations, or about what's lacking uh, in worship. <coughs> Even people who are thoroughly committed to experimental theology are using church growth methodology in their worship, while others are thoughtlessly bogged down in traditional worship. Now, I'm not nearly as critical of traditional worship in terms of of what is going on, but I do think it is ignoring uh, biblical patterns and reformed church history, as you will see. So we've got these so-called uh, worship wars. It used to be that wherever you went in Presbyterian Church, uh, there was pretty basic similarity in terms of what was going on, but, uh, to Korea, to Mexico, to uh, uh, Brazil. That's no longer the case. It's for that reason that seminary actually has a travel directory. Uh, and so as churches contact us and say, put us in the travel directory, if they have the approach to worship to which we are committed, they go on there. That helps people then because most of us probably have, maybe you haven't traveled enough to have the experience. It's a bad experience to end up in a, uh, a Presbyterian Reformed Church that is worshiping like the Charismatics or, or worse. So. Now, there's no longer a uniformity of worship. And there's contributing causes. Many pastors have no theology of worship. And that's because most seminaries have no required course in worship. Others leave the matter to committees of worship leaders, or worship leaders, although like almost all books of order um, say it's the pastor's responsibility uh, to prepare worship. And then much of the problem arises from the fact that we don't know why we do what we do. And others do that which other evangelicals are doing, and they seem to be hustling. Uh, <coughs> and then they look around for a theological rationale to give some credibility to what they're doing. <coughs> and actually, many of the newer innovations are unbiblical and fail to accomplish their stated purpose. But now also, in my opinion, traditional worship, though more biblical in form, lacks some serious biblical aspects that I will seek to address um, with you. So, covenantal worship, distinguish it from traditional and contemporary worship. Um, covenant theology not only defines God's dealings with us and ties us together all the Bible, but also dictates our piety, namely our response to God. So we first then uh, are going to look at the theology of worship. And this is the reader, chapter one. And I appreciate any uh, input on the reader. This is moving toward uh, publication. And so if, if it's merely mechanical typos or spelling, but uh, other questions as well are holes, I appreciate your, your input. All right. Um, We've discussed the purpose and requirements, so let's translate Psalm 100 from my erstwhile Hebrew um, <coughs> scholars. So, where are we back there? You pay. Adam. Mr. Christopher, <coughs> Adam. And the four of you, right? You what? Oh, you. Ah, Mr. G. We expect great things out of you now that you're married. So, <laughs> <coughs> so we'll let you start with the title. <laughs> you got the short draws. <laughs> a psalm of thanksgiving. Okay, so Mizmor la toda. Now, many people do not think the titles were inspired, but 
Dr. Shaw uh, believes that they are, as well as Dr. Piper. And they're in the Masoretic text. Uh, there is no need not to take them as part of the Spirit's uh, inspiration. So it's very important when we have these, uh, as they tell us either the purpose of the psalm or the background of the psalm, or sometimes they simply give us musical notations and we're just at sea. Um, but uh, in this case, we have now uh, uh, what this psalm is all about. And that's very important, isn't it, for our purposes. We'll come back to discuss this in a few moments. But this is a psalm to direct our thanksgiving to God. All right, Lipe, uh, verse 1, or verse 2 in the Hebrew. Um, shout out to Yahweh, all the earth. All right. So we've got a hitfall there of uh, Ruah, Hariu, to shout aloud or to shout out to Yahweh, uh, all the earth. Verse 3, Adam. Serve the Lord with joy. Come before him with a song. Okay, now we see here <clears throat> the shout is emphasized in exuberance. And then to serve Yahweh with uh, gladness, a joy, uh, simcha, and come before him uh, with singing. Matthias. Know that the Lord is God, He made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and sheep of His pasture. All right. So now we got this series of imperatives, don't we? So we've got uh, shout, uh, serve, come, know. Um, verse 4. Oh, you have your hand up? You're scratching again. No, I don't have my hand up. I'm not volunteering to do anything. You know, those smiling faces really help. But, uh, okay, verse 4, uh, Corey. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. All right. And uh, Miguel? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting to generation after generation. He is faithful. Okay. Now, Kesed, I prefer to think of loving kindness. It's much more than mercy. It has to do with God's covenant love for his special people. And so uh, his Kesed is everlasting. And Kesed and Menunah, um, or Menunah, Faithfulness are often joined together uh, in Scripture uh, as close companions. So its faithfulness is from generation to generation. Now there's a very interesting structure, and anybody can jump in at this point, by uh, end of this psalm. Anybody note the structure of the psalm? Okay, so we got two stanzas. Uh, so that's the first part, but then what's done in each stanza? There's a call to praise God. All right. And then you have, um, I guess you could say, reasons for Great. praising God. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the first stanza, we've got, this, uh, that's why I noted those imperatives. Um, uh, shout, serve, come, know. And then you've got an explanatory. Um, Hu Asanu uh, and Lo Anaknu, uh, Am Mo Vatson Mir Etho. So here is the why are we to shout, serve, come uh, with singing? Because he made us, and not we ourselves, and we are the sheep of his pasture, his covenant people. And then in the second stanza, we've got more imperatives. So, uh, 
Baru come into his gates with that thanksgiving, um, his courts uh, with praise. So you've got the imperative there into the gates and the courts. Um, and then give thanks to him and bless his name. Why? Look at the word, the little uh, conjunction there, key, because or for uh, Yahweh is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, his faithfulness is from generation to generation. So you've got two calls to worship, and they're enforced with imperatives. Now, in the reader, you'll see then, you saw how I will work that out in terms of the, the principles that we're seeking to derive from uh, Psalm uh, 100. So I've kind of tipped your hand here. What is meant when we hear about the worship wars? Anybody now? <clears throat> Nipe? Um, it is the failure of the church to grasp what is worship, what is the nature, what is the purpose of worship. Good, but why wars? Because each, each person today has a different opinion. Okay. So there's a great clash that's happening uh, within our denominations and of course with the broader uh, Christian public. And uh, what's one reason for this conflict? Which I've already don't understand the nature and purpose of worship. Don't understand the nature and the purpose of worship. So, in the introduction to the piece, I use a uh, an illustration. What what is that illustration? The CD ROM. Yeah. Oh yeah, the yeah. CD ROM. Now again, today it probably, I guess none of the millennials even know what a CD is. <laughs> so I guess I need to find a new illustration. But does anybody know what a CD is? Okay. <laughs> Well, I can remember when I got my uh, first uh, desktop. I had a, uh, it was called a portable computer, but the thing weighed a ton anyway. But when I went to California, I got a desktop, and there's this, this, push this button, and here comes this thing. I had a foggy notion. I never put a cup in it. But people did. And so the helplines and the texts were always getting calls that I broke my cup holder. And I broke the cup holder because they used it for its undesigned purpose. Now that is a, it's a natural physical principle. You say, can I pick on Clemson today or Auburn? Which one should I pick on Tim? Pick on Alabama. I'm sure. Okay, Clemson for sure. They're going to feel bad enough Monday night. So um, the uh, guy from Clemson goes into the hardware store and he wants a new saw. And so they sell him a really nice chainsaw takes that chainsaw, he goes home, um, comes back the very next day. I want my money back. This saw does not work. So the very nice uh, person puts it up on the counter. Let me see what's wrong here. <laughs> Guy jumps back. What's that noise? <laughs> he was just sawing with it, you see. <laughs> All right. That should be going to be better. Uh, we're off to a slow starter. Uh, but that's using something <coughs> according to its nature, and it always is failure. You know, drive a car around with no oil, and uh, maybe you experience that differently. Or maybe that's a better illustration for some of you, or whatever. But um, so it's it's a physical rule as with the computer, but it's a spiritual rule too. So, for example, um, if you uh, have been with us in Christ and salvation, we talk about these relationships in the order of salvation and the plan of salvation, if you get them out of sort, you're always going to come to wrong conclusions. You see, no, I don't think you have out of sort. Okay, I just, because I remember that was a question on the exam and you were looking at me and I thought, oh, what have I done? You got your exam back, didn't you? No, sir. Oh, okay, well. Just the paper. She's had them, but she was ill last week, so. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, that's our problem with worship, you see. We're using it for all the wrong purposes. O oftentimes, sincere purposes. We want to reach more people. We want to see people converted. But the question is, are those the reasons for which God designed worship? And that's what I think Psalm 100 uh, answers uh, for us. 
So because it is liturgical psalm by its own title, that it's a psalm, mismore, uh, for thanksgiving, then, and then as the content itself is directing us to a uh, liturgical response to God, it's a very appropriate psalm for us to examine in order to understand um, corporate worship. So what specific thing does God require in Psalm 100? Joy in worship. Okay, let's back off the joy and simply that he be worshipped. I think that's the bottom line. It's a psalm for thanksgiving. It's got these commandments. All the commandments have to do uh, with worship. <coughs> now, <coughs> what three things in the text demonstrate that the psalmist is calling us to corporate worship? The fact that he addresses the whole earth and believers in particular. Okay, so it's plural. Okay. The, the temple, the gates, the temple. Okay, the place, the temple. Yeah. That's what you meant, is the temple? Yeah. Yeah, the temple. So the place is the place of corporate worship. And then the third thing. Highest expression of worship. All right, the things that we're called on to do here. They're acts of corporate worship. They're in the plural, so that, you know, we are to sing, we are to praise, we're to bless, we're to give thanks. Uh, <coughs> now, John Frame will say that um, <coughs> in the New Testament, these things, terms are all used simply for Christian obedience and Christian service. And, and that is true. Uh, they are used in that way. Paul <coughs> defines his own ministry in terms of uh, cultic terms. We are called on to respond to God in terms of cultic terms, mean terms for the cult, for worship. So uh, present your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable, that's sacrificial uh, language. Uh, and, no, and no one will deny the fact that all of life is worship and that we as... I, that you can't deny the fact that all of life is worshipped because we are to glorify God in all that we do. And that is uh, worship. But what uh, the old writers, I forget was High Digger or who it was, but between what we refer to as generic worship and specific worship. So generic worship is yes. The Bible does use these terms to, to respond to our living for God's glory. But does the use of those terms in any way cause the um, responsibility of corporate worship to be lessened? Is there any subtraction uh, from uh, corporate worship uh, because the terms are used that way in the New Testament? So. Uh, I respond to John Frame, no. It's true that we worship God in all of life, but that is not the primary worship of Scripture. In fact, I will submit to you that if we're not worshiping God corporately in a proper manner, we cannot worship Him uh, generically in all of life. Just as if you're not under preaching, you're never going to profit from the private or family reading of the Word in the same way for the person who's under good I should say good biblical preaching and not just preaching. Uh, that's another problem. But anyway, <clears throat> so um, we see then that uh, worship is important. And if I asked you to defend uh, the importance of corporate worship, what are some things that you would uh, tell me from Scripture that actually are in your text? Did not never let the gathering. Yeah, well, that's there. Let's back up. Let's um, <coughs> define what we mean by worship and corporate worship in the in the first place. So, give me some definitions for worship or corporate worship. Corporate worship, I guess, in the strictest sense, would be a time set apart with a call to worship and closed by a benediction by a court of the Church of Christ 
for the express purpose of the worship of God. Good. You left out one very important thing. Oh, um, well, I, don't, I can't think of what I'm talking about. Bannerman. Public oh. worship is no other than the manner and the way in which sinners associate together in the church state are permitted in their collective capacity to hold intercourse with God, to maintain in a right and fitting way their fellowship with Him and approach Him day by day in acceptable communion. So it's also often referred to as social worship or corporate worship. So the parameters, call to worship and benediction, uh, but it's the church gathered together. We don't use those parameters in any other act of worship, though. Uh, Rayburn it gives a Christocentric definition. It's the activity of new life of a believer in which recognizing the fullness of the Godhead as is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and his mighty redemptive acts, he seeks by the power of the Holy Spirit to render to the living God the glory, honor, and submission which are his due. So there's the Christocentric nature, Trinitarian nature, and Bannerman brings in that social nature. Now, Frame will try to define this as formal worship. Um, and he's setting up a, a straw man then in contrast to informal worship. Uh, can corporate worship ever be informal? No. Or should it be? Let's put it that way. No. Should corporate worship ever be informal? Can we come into God's presence and let down our hair if we had any left? Um, and the uh, answer is no. We come into God's presence uh, as his uh, sons, but daughters, but as his servants. We come into the court of uh, God. Now, one analogy uh, that I find useful to try to distinguish between life worship and corporate worship is that if you lived on the estate of a great king uh, and you had your specific responsibilities, you're serving the king, whether you're the milkmaid or the herdsman or his banker or, or his soldier, and you would dress appropriately for those responsibilities. But then the king holds court, and there's a different protocol, isn't there? There's a different etiquette. And the king holds court. And you don't want to show up uh, for court uh, not dressed appropriately, not behaving appropriately. So just Christ is getting to a much even deeper issue, but the man in the feast without the wedding garments, of course, that's the righteousness of Christ, but it still can. Do you consider the uh, courtly language is even different from what you might say is street normal conversation language as well? Yeah. I don't think we want slang in the pulpit or the worship service. It doesn't have to be highfalutin, but there needs to be language that does respect, uh, reflects reverence. I don't think we have to go to thee and thou right to do that, because for most people that does not bespeak reverence any longer. But at least it's the concept there in that, that we must approach God consistent with who he is in a reverent manner. And so we're not talking about formal or informal, we're talking about societal, corporate worship, people coming in together in the body of Christ, adults and children coming uh, in a peculiar manner, as we'll unpack in a moment, into the presence of God. So, uh, yes? How much would you say that reverence is dictated by culture? Well, that's a good question. Throw it out. First, you have to define what you mean by reverence. Um, Not throw it out of the room. Throw it into the room. <coughs> yeah. Well, I'm happy for anybody to address well, that. First, you got to define reverence, though. So. Um, giving due honor and um, uh, approaching God in a way that Mission to um, okay, so um, in, in response to that, I would say that we have a low view of reverence, at least in this culture, of just how you know children will treat their parents, how they'll talk, talk flippantly about the president or anybody that's in power. So, obviously, our view of the word and how we're called to give reverence to God should also dictate how we show reverence. Okay, let's agree on this then, that uh, reverence is an attitude of fear, love, and respect, faith, that we owe to God. We'll go that far together. 
All right, now, Mr. Dodson. I was just going to say, I think you no, just say it. an argument that reverence, okay. you can root it in a sense in the, in the command to honor thy father and thy mother. So there has to be uh, what you said, what fear, love, and respect, and so as we as we look at at that, we can work our way out from the fifth commandment, perhaps, as to what would be a uh, a cross culturally reverent, okay, and wholesome worship. Josh is doing it by MP3. He is. I don't normally allow that. I wasn't a consultant. <coughs> He's an MMRE student. Oh, he's not doing it for credit. Well, he's doing it for credit for the MMRE. Why does it matter? All those classes are eligible for the <coughs> according to the catalog. Okay. For, but just for that program. All right. Thank you. All right. So, uh, <coughs> what would be a different reverent expression then in Nigeria, where I go every other year, or in Women. <coughs> I'm not sure how. I don't know anything about Nigeria. Can't answer that question. Well, all right. <laughs> he just spent half his life there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the Word of God dictates worship, and so I've had an opportunity last year to worship in Nigeria and Ghana, and the worship is very much the same as here in the United States, in the southern U.S., or up in Ontario, uh, with respect to those things. Well, the things, but reverence. But the, the reverence is there as well. Yeah, okay. So I think that, are you thinking more in terms about what we would refer to as the accidents? In other words, in certain Latin American countries, in the Philippines, a dress shirt would be an embroidered shirt, uh, not a coat and tie. Or in Nigeria, it might be uh, a robe, a tribal robe, but a, a formal tribal robe. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of was getting at is are we how how do we come to a universal standard as he said of communicating reverence? How much that is changes from place to place, and only in the accidents. So how a person dresses. Um, would be one of the primary ways how they behave in worship shouldn't really change a great deal. But there would be those accidental things, I would think, in terms of uh, how they dress. Uh, now, there are other accidental things that I'll get to later in terms of, say, music. Uh, but if you did that, so for example, I'm not just greatly enjoying singing hymns and psalms to drums. But that's what they sing by. And so... Uh, I'm not going to pass judgment then and say this worship is not reverent because they're using musical instruments that in my context would be coming uh, out of a whole different culture from Yalu, where it is, it is the way they sing. Uh, and so uh, those are kind of things, I think, if I understand you correctly. There was another, another hand. Sure. I was just going to say that I think in the Word of God you find the character of the true worshiper, like clearly illustrated to me by Isaiah 66, verse 2. You know, blessed, uh, you mm -hmm. go into the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor. You see the same thing in Isaiah. You see it with David in Psalm 51, what is it, verse 17. And I think that the, the essential of the attitude of the worshiper is, is cross cultural. And I think that. You know, you have accidents, like the way that the dress is conducted or whatever, but I think there's even a principle in the accidents. And yeah. that, is, that is that you are to, I think, I would argue anyway, you're, you're to dress presentably as you're coming into the presence of God. Now, in, in different cultures, that's going to look right. very differently, but I, would, I guess I would just posit that as... Yeah, well, that's what I said. If whatever dress appropriate dress wear is in that culture is appropriate dress wear in that culture's worship. Appropriate dress wear for meeting with high dignitaries, I mean, not just everyday dress wear. Well, I was just going to say, because then I've often run in, I go to the URC, <coughs> and I've often run into people who say, well, 
you know, what's appropriate for me in dress and what's appropriate for you in dress may be different. Okay. And we'll come back to that whole issue. <coughs> Good. Thank you. All right. So start the Old Testament. Give me some arguments, uh, again, from the piece of um, why corporate worship is important. The Sabbath. All right. The Sabbath with its responsibilities. We have the express command to do it. So it's obviously important that we have the express command. All right. So we've got an express command. Well, I think I skipped over the English word worship comes from the Anglo-Saxon um, uh, worth Skype. It's a term meaning worthiness or expressing uh, worldliness, worthiness. Um, so just again, back in Genesis, the first of the year, and it's remarkable, Abraham, what does he do? He enters the land, what does he do? He worships. He builds an altar and he proclaims the name of Jehovah. He goes down south, builds an altar, proclaims the name of Jehovah. Comes back up to the place, builds an altar, proclaims the name of Jehovah. It was essential to his covenant relationship uh, with God. So uh, all those passages uh, in the Abrahamic story, uh, Israel, Exodus 12, 16, and, and what God says in Exodus 19, that... Uh, what, 12, 16 is uh, tell Pharaoh that my, my people to go out three days and do what? Worship, Worship God. Uh, was that just an excuse, a strategy? No, that was the primary reason that God uh, delivered them from uh, bondage. Um, Deuteronomy 12 lays out now the center of worship uh, and what you had to do there in contrast to what you would do uh, elsewhere. Uh, and then Psalm 22, 22 is very interesting because there is the risen Savior in the midst of the worship assembly proclaiming the name of God. He's the worship leader. So every time we assemble for corporate worship, Christ is in our midst. Uh, he is leading us in the praise and um, uh, worship of God. Just... Let's go and look at that passage quickly. So this, you know, the first half is the humiliation. Second half is the exaltation. Verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear Jehovah, praise him. All you seed of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you seed of Israel. So here's Christ's vow. That as he is exalted, he's going to stand in the midst of the assembly. You'll, you'll see a number of references in the Psalms uh, to the righteous man who is Christ uh, in the assembly, keeping his vows and uh, praising uh, God. So we come to the uh, New Testament. Is there any lessening uh, on uh, the responsibility of worship? No, sir. All right. Give me some biblical... Well, so I, I think that if I can... Somebody just, else now. You, you're... Uh, <laughs> all right, that's great. I'll just... You're good. Can I go to the washroom? Hmm. Mm. Okay. All right, thank you, Doug. Let's just take a little break. Let's look at some uh, other New Testament examples. Uh, the description in Acts 2.46 of the new church, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. Whoops, that's not one thing. I want to be, and that's what they were doing day by day. But 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teach, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And Calvin, and it's not just Calvin, but the later reformers as well point out, he's basically describing a worship service. This begins to get at the answer to to your question. That's what the New Testament church was marked by, this corporate assembly. Um, so it was uh, expository. Fellowship has to do with the alms, breaking of bread, the sacraments. Prayer is in the plural, if I remember correctly, here in uh, in the Greek, as the footnotes say. 
uh, yeah, which is used in this way for the, all the uh, uh, vocal acts of worship, of praise and supplication, confession. Would you say that most of the instances in the book of Acts where it talks about breaking of bread or sacramental? I think most were. I think here in, in chapter 2 we probably get uh, some um, <coughs> um, fellowship meals as well with the daily being in the houses and breaking bread. But I, after Acts 2, I would say all of them are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It becomes a technical word by that point as the church develops. It's maybe not at this point, but by the time you see it in Troas, for example, it's become, I think, a technical phrase for the corporate worship. And then uh, uh, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And in the end of Hebrews 12, after Paul contrasts the New Covenant Church with the Old Covenant Church, he then says in uh, uh, verse 28, Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God acceptable servants with reverence and awe. So obviously we're talking here again about that phrase, acceptable service, corporate um, worship. <coughs> Exegetically, Mr. Horner, John 4, which we'll deal with later, but uh, God is a spirit and is speak, seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. So as I mentioned what Moses says to Pharaoh, it's the primary object of our conversion that we become the people to to worship God. Um, now, we'll come back to the examples from, <coughs> from the, the Bannerman quotation as well. <coughs> Guess it's later. Okay. So, <coughs> yeah, really, uh, There's the quotation from uh, Clarkson and Bannerman. Is that in, in the first reader? Yeah, one yeah, page. Sure. Yeah. What page? 13, I believe. Yep. Okay, that's the problem. I wasn't going to. Might want to move that back up above. Okay. This is on my mind because it's Mr. Horner's very good question. And that is how do we, um, how do we know from the scripture? that um, corporate worship is the most serious part. So here we get to the corporate worship as the means of grace is where I'm, I deal with that. So Benjamin points out that all the elements of worship to which we have referred are part of a public ordinance, not a private. They belong to the body of believers collectively, not individually. They're to be enjoyed. <coughs> Uh, as means of grace, not by Christians separately, but by Christians in their church state and communion with one another. And even where the individual use of these ordinances is not impossible or unlawful, but the reverse, they're not used in the same, <coughs> the same gracious effect, nor have they the same gracious influences in the case of social and joint employment of them. In short, the blessings upon ordinances is but half a blessing when enjoyed alone, even in those cases when the ordinances may be used by the Christian apart from others. All the parts of church worship belong to a peculiar and emphatic sense, the church, and they're made effectual by the presence and spirit of Christ as his instruments for building up and strengthening the collective body of believers in a manner 
and to an extent unknown in the case of private and solitary worship. And Clarkson, on Psalm 87, verse 3, um, develops the thesis of why public worship is to be preferred before private. He gives 12 reasons. Uh, the Lord is more glorified, there's the clearest manifestations of God to be found, there's more spiritual advantage, and it's more edifying. So those are some of the reasons. And then when I get into what we're doing there, I'll come back a bit more to that, Mr. Horner, as well. And you can push back at that point. So who, to whom do the commandments of Psalm 100 apply? All people. All people. And so I hope you see this as you're dealing with the self-righteous, which we have a lot of them in the South, uh, and in the Dutch church. People think, well, I'm a member of the church, all is well with me. And um, this failure to worship God by Christ according to his word is the greatest offense that any person can make against God. And so it's a very good way to address those who are quite complacent and, and self-righteous. Um, all people are responsible. And what do we do? Well, Paul says in Romans 1, the natural man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness and refuses to give God that worship that's right. So even those that are in the church week after week are still refusing to give God what is His. So they don't give them themselves. They're not coming through Christ come in the base of their own works, and thus they're basically uh, idolaters. But particularly, we recognize that this is um, a requirement for um, the covenant people. And we see that again, uh, say, for example, there in verse 3, know that Jehovah made you, not you yourselves. You are his people, the people of his pasture. All right, so we have this duty, which is also a privilege, to think that the Most High God would allow us to come acceptably into His presence, is um, but should astonish us when we really stop and think about it. Angels, um, God's too pure for them to look on Him. So we're reading Job. Um, they're finite creatures, and they're sinless, and yet there's such a distance between them and the Holy One. Uh, Isaiah's vision of, uh, I saw Adonai high and lifted up, and he's undone. So it's a remarkable privilege. All right, so uh, with this in mind, we look next at the character and purpose of worship. Uh, what's the biblical term that's used here? It summarizes the other things. Okay, right. serve. Now in that context, I tell you that there are three primary terms in Scripture, um, Old and New Testament parallel uh, for worship. So there is um, Shaka or Proskuneo, which is the Hebrew, uh, the, Shaka is the Hebrew, and Proskuneo, and this has to do with the uh, the attitude of coming into this presence of the Holy One with reverence and awe and bringing to Him those things that He has uh, required. Now on the other end is the uh, Hebrew term sharath and the Greek liturgeo. And uh, you can hear a word there in liturgeo or the noun liturgia. What's the word you hear? Liturgy. Liturgy. Mm -hmm. And there... The word sharath was used for the liturgical acts performed by the Levites and the priest. And the New Testament liturgical acts then, for example, in Acts chapter 13, um, Paul and the others in Antioch with prayer and fasting were serving the Lord. And that's this word. When we get to liturgy, I'll simply point out, I'll just say in passing now, uh, there's not such a thing as a non-liturgical church. Okay? Every church has a liturgy. It's either a really bad liturgy or a good liturgy. It's going to be the things that we do and how we organize them in worship. And what ties these two things together is this word, uh, abed, the, the verb to serve, uh, the noun, servant. And what's shocking about this term is it's the term of, of the work of a slave or a servant. 
Now, sometimes, and this is, uh, I got to correct Psalm 100 here. Psalm 100 here in the Septuagint is translated by uh, duleo, which again is the more base term uh, for the work of a servant serving his master. The other Greek term, though, that is used for serve is latreo, a latria. And so this still has to do with the work of worship. It doesn't focus as much as the form of avad or duleo does, but it's still a very important term. Now, there are other minor terms. I mentioned uh, some of those uh, other terms um, there on uh, page uh, 8. Saveomai uh, is a New Testament term. Threskea, uh, religious observance. But the three primary terms in the Bible are we, trans we would translate worship, serve, and then the things that we would do, the liturgy of worship and uh, service. Now immediately we have an issue that's addressed here. If we understand this commandment is a commandment to work, right? Would we agree on that? So this addresses one of the causes for innovations in contemporary worship, or in what I would refer to as a highly mandatory liturgical worship. What's that issue? Participation. You hear it time and again. We want a worship that's more participatory. <coughs> so on the high end, it's full of these uh, one-sentence versicles where the leader says something and the congregants respond and you go through uh, <coughs> endless repetition. This is supposed to involve the congregation. I frankly find it deadening. Um, but on the other end, uh, is this clamor in evangelicalism, we need more participation. You see, it's a failure to understand what we're doing in worship, and that is we are working to serve God. And it's a work that every one of us does from the call to worship through the benediction and doxology. And uh, it's cap uh, captured in our Westminster Standards when it says that even as one listens to the preaching of the Word of God conscionably with care, that's an act of worship. So listening to the scriptures read and preached, we are to be worshiping. So our mouths don't have to be open to be participants. Our hearts have to be open, acting in faith. And so we must ourselves be instructed and instruct those then for whom we have any responsibility <coughs> that you're coming here to do a work. You're not passive. If you're passive, it is a sin on your part to be passive in the corporate assembly. Everybody with me on that? Question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so is it right to understand that either in the high church, high informality, or in the low church, um, high emphasis on charismatic expression, the error, although it looks different, is still the same because it's, it's overly prioritizing the external? Is that? But surely the case with the, the highly required liturgy. Uh, yeah, I was, that's an interesting point. I think in, in terms of the free-for-all, it also it emphasizes the external. Now, I find the, the higher to be more deadening. The, the other is just more maddening. But the, the higher is just deadening. I was, I was at a thing this weekend, and we had a very good fellowship, but we had one, two, three vespers, and they were all just repetitive. Um, the vespers? Hmm? You went to something called Vespers? Well, no, I went to a conference that had three um, Vespers of 10 minutes each or whatever. Mm -hmm. so. But it said good words. But I still find it to be, this is public now, so anyway, I found it to be non. You're supposed to be engaging people, and it's actually not engaging. I mean, I'll just I'll put it that way. I mean, a little bit of that's good, but too much of it. <laughs> what do you mean, a little bit? Well, I, 
would not mind using Cramer's Book of Common Prayer in my devotions. There's a um, rabbit trail or rabbit hole. <laughs> Bad <laughs> things happen in rabbit holes. <laughs> what, um, what advice, like I don't have little ones, Lord willing, yet, but um, uh, I, Lord willing, <laughs> yet. <laughs> 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 so what, what are some ways that you would suggest? Tell me uh, again about public education in a hospital. That's true. I'm trying to write it back in. Um, um, what other ways would you suggest that we would uh, engage our little ones in the public worship. How we're saying that, you know, we're, we're little worshipers as well. Right. So what are some ways that you would exhort us to help well, children engage um, in worship? We begin with established family worship. Right. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> where they, they learn to sit still mm-hmm. uh, and uh, then they learn to, uh, to pray, listen to scriptures, read and explain, do the catechism. Uh, and that very discipline itself will uh, enable them increasingly to uh, go to public worship. It's still not, some of these people uh, have young children and uh, they have them in, in worship. And um, so they, anybody that wants to uh, contribute to that. Memorizing some of the uh, things like the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, the doxology, the creed uh, is very useful to help them. And then uh, I think it's good. Uh, Winter Frodo started doing this uh, about middle of the week, maybe Thursday or Friday, but they will give, <coughs> send out an email, and I know Shiloh does this as well, where the text, sermon title, and the hymns are all listed. And so then, particularly with children, you're able to sing those hymns and psalms uh, in the family uh, before you, you go there as well. So you want to add anything, John? It's just, uh, it's neat to memorize sometimes psalms and hymns to sing, because when kids can't read, they can still sing along, yep. and they get quite excited about that when that selection comes up in church. That's good, and one of the things when I was pastoring in Texas, that, and I think it case California as well, that in Sunday school, um, they would memorize a psalm one month and a hymn the next month, and I would incorporate that into uh, corporate worship. Uh, what I do is I uh, text my pastor on Saturday and ask him some of the key terms he's going to be using in a sermon. And then I make a little uh, crossword puzzle for my girls and I print that out. Huh. Uh, any pushback on that? Do you think that's a bit too distracting? Like they're just trying to find the words or any, any thoughts on that? Well, it might be the problem with that is they're not, they're not going to get the that's forest right. for the trees. Uh, it might be better to have them write down the words that they're recognizing, so they're getting them into a sentence form, I think, rather than getting it isolated. Uh, now, and I don't, I've not looked at it. Uh, Miguel can help us here. Winter Road publishes a children's note-taking thing. What's what all is on that, Miguel? I won't say you didn't sure. know. Intern for the what? child. <laughs> So we should grab that and see what they do there. All right, good. Good question. All right, so that's the first thing we do is serve. And what is the second commandment here that we do? You could could summarize this entire psalm with one sentence. To serve God in his special presence place. This gets the final answer to your question. Uh, Mr. Horner. So we um, we serve God, and we serve God in His special presence. Now we see that in the Psalm, in that second stanza. <clears throat> yep. So the gates and and the courts refer to what here? The temple, the temple complex. And for the faithful uh, old covenant person, what do we know about this temple? Well, it was the special presence of God. And so you enjoyed God's presence elsewhere. David will discover that in in his exile. He talks about that in a couple of the Psalms. But 
Here was the throne of God. Here was the visual manifestation of the theophany of God's presence. God was present in the temple in a way that he was not present anywhere else in uh, Israel. So God's everywhere. We understand that. We're talking about his gracious presence. And we're talking about this fantastic manifestation of his grace. Well, where is our temple? We don't have one. Well, we do. We do. Jesus Christ, Christ is the temple, and we are the temple. So he's the temple, and we are living stones incorporated into this temple, which expresses our, our union uh, with Christ. And so uh, the one who said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up, is both our temple and our priest. He's entered the Holy of Holies on our behalf. The veil has been torn apart, and now we're bid in Hebrews 10 to come into his presence. So we enter his courts when we come to him in the manner that he has uh, appointed. So even though it would be a secondary application where two or three are gathered in his name, referring to church discipline, he's present. When we come and gather in his name then for this higher act, then we know of his presence. Uh, it is um, possible because of our union with Christ. And so Paul says we're seated with him in the heavenlies. And then one of the articles of Lockman talks about the fact that in another sense he's, he's coming down to us. We are worshiping in a supernatural spiritual environment that exceeds the place where we are, surpasses it. And we are mingling with angels and the souls of just men made perfect. So we have that spelled out for us in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 22. You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly. I always say jokingly that when we get to heaven, we're all Presbyterians. <laughs> Not too jokingly. And the church of the firstborn who are ruled, enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, the spirits of just men made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant into the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And of course that insight that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, that we actually are worshiping in the presence of angels. Verse 10, therefore we ought to have a symbol of authority on our head because of the angels. Quite remarkable, isn't it? That we are coming, and this why is the most important thing. God is present there in a way that he is in none, uh, no other activity. And that's one of the greater blessings that are attached to it. <clears throat> so, uh, R.B. Kuyper, how lofty a concept of corporate worship scripture presents. God meets them, they meet God, they find themselves face to face with none other than God himself. Their worship is an intimate transaction between them and their God. So when we gather with God's people in a local congregation on the Lord's Day, the elders exercise the keys of the kingdom. Where two or three are gathered as discipline, that's what the call to worship is. It's opening the kingdom to all now who have gathered. And God says, come, come into my gracious presence. Any question about that? I mean, I, this needs to grip us quickly changes the whole approach to reverence and everything else if we really stop and think about the fact that we've come up to the throne room of God. Or if he's come to us, the throne room is this supernatural mingling. And it's very useful then to think about as well. The building is uh, not the primary thing because some in our Reformed traditions, after worship in uh, small, unattractive places, shopping centers, uh, houses. Others have church buildings they can't afford to keep up. Uh, you'd like to serve God in a way more aesthetically pleasing, but don't have the resources. But remember, Christ has come, and worship's not tied to a physical place, as we'll see tomorrow morning. We worship God by the Spirit of Christ. <coughs> So what are the three things that we do then as we serve God in his special presence? We offer him praise because of who he is. Okay, so we first bring to him 
this whole basket full, this plethora of praise and adoration, thanksgiving, uh, words and acts of honor. So this is what we're doing. We see this then, to shout joyfully to the Lord, come before him with joyful singing, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, give thanks to him. Uh, bless his name. So when we serve God in our worship, we do these liturgical acts. Uh, we praise, adore, bless, thank, describe his greatness, beauty, and splendor. And notice that we do these things with exuberance. Now this was in Mr. Dotson's definition, which frankly surprised me, but I was glad that it was in there. Um, because I'm not sure, I'm not sure that um, a great deal of Reformed worship today is marked by exuberance. Would that be an unfair statement? Most of the preaching is pretty tepid. <laughs> Definitely. And that's exactly ought to be the center of it. Uh, that's where God meets with us most singularly. But, I mean, all right, how do you fulfill, and I will tell you how later, but uh, how do you fulfill this coming into his presence and shout joyfully and come with gladness? Shall we do that with a prepared heart? Okay, it's first a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. But these aren't heart expressions necessarily, are they? Mm -hmm. I think you need to sing loudly. All right. You need to sing robustly. Mm -hmm. What about the shout? And it's not the only commandment in the Psalms to shout. Or to say amen. Very good. The corporate amen after prayer and as you'll see, I also teach after singing. Shout it. So Jerome describes it one time in Bethlehem. It was like a peal of thunder that rolled across the ascent. Once you've experienced that, you have to go worship with people that don't do it or don't do it consistently or kind of mumble it. I feel cheated. You know, this has become a part of my worship DNA. Uh, and God's people are cheated. We are, and I'll say this about other things as well. As Reformed people worshiping, we ought to provoke charismatics to jealousy. We've got Amen. the right things. Amen. <laughs> Amen right? We got the right things, but we don't do it. And if we did the right things and did it um, with the entirety of our body, um, it is a glorious, glorious experience. So we're going to come back to posture. I'm just kind of laying the foundations. Interesting about culture. I mean, as Canadians, you know, we, we're more subdued. You know, there's a lot of Dutch Reformed, even in the Presbyterian circles. Well, I know. Yeah. You know, and so it's interesting to have us think about that. And so the cultural component, even across the, the, the 49th parallel, changes sometimes the way worship <laughs> is administered and, and done. And so I, that's maybe Remember, John, thinking. we're only subdued until a good old hockey game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is man. idolatry, yes. <laughs> idolatry. <laughs> the great sports, the great equalizer, huh? <laughs> There's we know what people really are like. All right. In like the experimental churches, like the worship is subdued, but like consistory meetings can just be shamed. <laughs> yeah. Our church but they always th th they always leave on a good footing, don't they? They've no, been... I, I had to go to a consistory meeting once in my wife's church, and my father-in-law is an elder, and he said if the minister yells at you, yell back, because he won't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's not your experience. <laughs> All right. What's the second aspect? Our communion with God. Our communion with God. Again, now we get into the heart uh, of worship. So know that Yahweh, He's God. He made us and we are His, his uh, people and the sheep of His pasture. Know is an experimental term, you see. It doesn't mean know about God. No, it's you're coming knowing Him as a husband and a wife know each other in the most intimate way that he has appointed. And so in worship, there is to be this concept, we're entering into God's presence and, and we are gazing on his loveliness. And as we engage in his loveliness and he, he speaks to us, we then respond to him. And there's a conversation that's taking place now between both individuals and the congregation and the triune God. And what we want to happen 
is that as we see his loveliness and our hearts are ravished. Uh, at this conference I was at, uh, actually a, a young lady, I know her family quite well, she took IRT uh, a year ago. She did a thing on John Donne's uh, poem um, about God battering me and that ends with, because of the slowness of my affections, ravish me. And of course, moderns don't understand that. <laughs> they actually some have called God the rapist in oh, Dunn's oh. mind. But in fact, it's in, it's in Augustine's Confessions. What's going to deliver him from his unchastity is to be ravished with the beauty and glory of God. And again, we've got to get back to this in our worship. And as Zach has said, it's preaching is where this will take place. But it's God speaks um, in scripture reading and uh, prayers and communion, we respond. He says, I am your God. And we say, we are your people. Particularly in the Lord's Supper, we see this, and the reason we call it uh, communion. So we want to see more of God's beauty and loveliness as we come to worship. And then the purposes of liturgical service and communion lead to the third purpose, and that is edification. God has in his wisdom designed this corporate act by which he's to receive uh, our acts of devotion and in which we interact with him to be the primary way that he enables us to die to sin and grow conform to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the corporate means of grace are always more beneficial. Not that we neglect the other, but are always more beneficial. Are you going to say something? Okay. All right. So... I've already given you the Bannerman quotation. So we come quickly then to the foundation of worship. Uh, and that's that structure that we have in the psalm with a set of imperatives with grounds, a set of imperatives with grounds. And out of those grounds, uh, God gives us three primary grounds or basis that it are to motivate uh, uh, and shape our worship. And what are they? The names of God? Uh, his attributes. Thank you, Togrel. His attributes and his worth. So the catechism, at least in the Westminster Catechism, I think it's the same in the Heidelberg as well. What is God's name uh, in the fifth commandment is that way by which he reveals himself to us. And, and Westminster spells that out. Names, title, attributes, uh, works, ordinances. So the name of God um, is uh, the way that God reveals himself. And in his formal names, and the psalmist uses two here, <coughs> know that Jehovah, he is God, or Elohim. Now, Elohim is his last name. It's his surname. It's the name by which he first introduces himself to us in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Used uh, some 200 times, 250, 260 in the Old Testament. Uh, it uh, is the name that speaks to us of a sovereignty, of creation, power, of glorious providence. It speaks to us of eternity, as almost all the names of God do, uh, particularly as they're found in their context. But I say it's a surname, and we know that the others have stolen that name. And so false gods will call themselves Elohim as well. And the Bible recognizes that. So at times the Bible refer to false gods with the same last name, Elohim. But notice the structure. Know that Jehovah, he is Elohim. And Jehovah is his first name. It's his personal name. It's his covenant name. And it's what distinguishes him from all other pretenders. And you remember the context where that name is revealed, um, where on uh, Mount Sinai, Moses is wants some credentials, and God gives him a verb, tell him I am who I am, sent you. But from that verbal form, we get the uh, letters for Yahweh. We don't even know how to pronounce it because the Jews superstitiously simply always pronounce it Adonai. Uh, but, um, and that name is symbolized in a bush that's on fire, 
It is not consumed, which means the fire is self-existent. And God is self-existent. He has no beginning. He's eternal, self-existent, independent God. Who then enters into covenant with his people and is known personally by them? So what does Gabriel say to Joseph? You'll call his name Jehovah saves. Ken? Well, it sounds to me, I was just thinking when you mentioned the surname and the personal name distinguishes them all their gods. I mean, this sounds like it would be a strong argument against the insider movement, would it not? Well, yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Good. What's the insider movement? Yeah. Insider movement is a uh, latest fad in missiology where particularly, it doesn't have to be just Muslims. It could be Mormons or, or whatever, Buddhist. But when a person is converted, they're told to stay inside uh, their false religion and not uh, make any overt profession of faith, but try to influence things from inside out. So wouldn't that be like just idolatry? Yeah, that's, that's about like idolatry. <laughs> it was one of the things, at least my denomination, thoroughly condemned. They haven't thoroughly condemned some things, but they have thoroughly condemned that. And for that, I'm very... Uh, All right, so do these two names together remind us that God is the eternal sovereign creator, sustainer, and redeemer? And that lays the foundation for the works that are given to us that uh, He Himself made us, not we ourselves, which refers in the first place to His work of creation. And uh, the sub-creation then, he forms each of us, Psalm 139, in the wombs of our mothers. Um, and then, uh, of course, the new creation. Uh, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And that also is by his gracious, sovereign, covenantal work of creation. So the two names relate to the two great works of God, which is creation, providence, and redemption. And these are the pillars of our whole existence and life with God in response to Him. And then the first thing that was mentioned by Jogrel, and that is His attributes. And we have four attributes listed here in the end of the psalm, and they are... Good, faithful, loving kindness... And the one that's the nose in front of your face? Everlasting. He's everlasting. He's eternal, which is repeated. All right, so this is just a sampling. And um, those of you who have had theology, prolegomena, know that when we say God is simple being, that means he's indivisible. And there's not a part of God that's one of these things and a part of God's another. God is his attributes. They are the clearest manifestation of his essence. And so... Any of them that are put out there on the table are put out there to represent that God is simply known by his attributes. But because we are finite, God allows us to learn about him by breaking down the attributes and studying each one. Uh, but they're more like the facets of a diamond, uh, and it's one diamond, just a billion infinite carats. So uh, he is, uh, his kesed is, his, I already said, his covenant love particularly that love that he has for his elect people. His uh, goodness, we read in Exodus 34, is um, his particularly, four things are spelled out there. He's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and full of loving kindness and faithfulness and forgiving sin. His faithfulness then is his veracity, but also his keeping of all of his word, all of his promises, all of his threats, giving us a word that is faithful and without error in the Bible. And then as we've already stated, he is indeed everlasting. Now, a practical outworking here of the foundation teaches us something very important, and this, somebody alluded to this, I think Sam alluded to this a while ago, is the heart. And so, if God gives us these grounds or foundations of worship, what does that teach us about how we are to approach God in worship? With care. Care. The same characteristics or attributes. But 
What does care mean? What do you mean by care, Sam? Fear. Yeah, but we're... Knowledge. How to Keep worship. going. Preparation. Very good. My Brazilian guy has always come through. <laughs> so, preparation. If, if we, we have two sets of commandments with these grounds, if they're the grounds for the imperatives for worship, then how are they to work in our lives? We are, this means that we are to focus on God as he's revealed himself to us in names, titles, attributes, and work, and enable then to have our hearts stirred up so that we come into his presence corporately. We're not depending upon the corporate assembly to ignite our emotions, but for our and our families. Uh, contemplation on God. So in my book on the Sabbath, I use the uh, <coughs> illustration of thoroughbreds running in the Kentucky Derby. If you ever watch that on television, how hard it is to get one of those thoroughbreds into the starting gate and to keep him still. Why? He's been bred to do one thing, and that is to run, like the wind. And that's how we need to be, if God were gracious to us, and I'm really like this, but to come to worship where I would have to be restrained. In the spirit of the prophets under the prophet. That I'm ready to praise and worship God. And I've got to be restrained by the fact I'm in the public assembly. But that's, that's where I want my heart. That's where you want your heart. Uh, and that is, is Sam, that, that is the most important part. Then worship will become joyful and beautiful if our hearts have been prepared. So David Steele, a Puritan, has a book on distractions in worship. It's basically a book on the importance of preparation in worship. And you'll come across that in Burroughs as well uh, when you read uh, that work. Then there's two practical outworkings of this that address the current problem. And what are they? Two important lessons derived from this song. <clears throat> the object of our worship not being ourselves, but okay. that worship is to be theocentric and not egocentric. That we're not coming to be moved and to feel good about ourselves, to have uh, a kind of an emotional high. That's a great problem today. Uh, it's the criteria people put on churches and whether they're going to stay at a church or not. Uh, but worship, in the first place, is all about God. Now, we've already seen our emotions are not disengaged. They should be highly engaged. <coughs> and if we focus on God, we'll be moved to the very depth of our being. So I use the illustration of marriage. And we know that in marriage, if spouses focus on their own fulfillment, then marriage is doomed, isn't it? If you focus on the fulfillment of your spouse, you will be fulfilled and you will have a blessed marriage normally. So we focus on God and then we will. So it's not that we neglect one another. So we sing hymns to one another as, and psalms as well as, as to God. There is a <clears throat> horizontal element in worship, but the primary focus is going to be on God, Sean. Uh, you know, uh, as you were saying, I'm seeing parallels. Not that we are the object of worship for Jesus, but when Jesus says, "I didn't come to be served, but to serve," and in, in doing that, He is um, in that active role of serving, giving honor and glory to God. I just saw a lot of those parallels there. What you were just saying, I thought was pretty neat. Um, but sorry. Well, and, and isn't that what Paul says, Philippians, my joy will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You obey, my jo I'm going to be mm -hmm. filled with joy, or, or 1 John uh, chapter 1. So we've got to redirect people's attention. You know, it's not about me. Can I read a quote from the minister of Gateway Church in Texas? He just made, put this message out for his people. Oh, good. It's about 36,000 people in terms of his worship. He asked this question, what do you do during your Sabbath that refuels you? That was a good question. Mm -hmm. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6, 17, to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. I encourage you to read a book or watch a silly movie. 
wet that fishing line, work that jigsaw puzzle, hang out with the people who feed your soul and warm your heart, try a new restaurant, sit on your back porch and stare into space. It's all spiritual if it recharges and refreshes you. The Sabbath isn't a religious chore you have to do so God won't be mad at you. It's a gift God has instructed you to give yourself so you can be his healthy, productive, long-lived representative to a broken world and accomplish everything he put you on this earth to do. That's why he has 36,000 here. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> hey, we've got two of our graduates right now that are without pulpits because of their teaching on the Sabbath. Because of? They're teaching on the Sabbath. They're in Reformed churches, highly Reformed churches. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great problem. It is a gift, isn't it? But we use it where the gift giver intended, and we will be recharged. All right, the second thing, then, is that worship is covenantal and not evangelistic. It's clear from the language, isn't it? Uh, we're coming to the God. Know ye uh, that uh, Jehovah is God. He made us, not we ourselves. Come into His presence. Come and serve Him. So we have turned this into a means of gathering non-converted people and shallow worldly people, um, and we're doing things, then, that will please them, not considering that we're supposed to be doing things to please God. So I use the illustration, and I had the privilege of being in Israel a few years ago, and actually the Hebrew Christian family with which I was staying, and their son had a birthday while I was there. So I got to go to the birthday party. Of course, that presented a problem uh, for them. So I, uh, Pipa, the Gentile, is going to be here, but we have Middle Eastern food, we sing Hebrew songs and play Hebrew games. But he's here, so perhaps we should have an American birthday party with cake and ice cream and American songs and American games. Now, if they had done that, whose party would it have been? Mine, not the little boys. So that's, that's exactly, we're turning God's feast into a human party to make other people feel comfortable. Now, what happened there, and what we should do, and we'll talk about this in leading worship, is that People were coming alongside of me and explaining things to me, you know, what this game was about and, and what, what we're singing with these words and um, uh, what this food is and everything, and that's highly appropriate. But we must focus on the covenantal relationship, the communion that's to take place with God as we, uh, as we gather there. At the end of the day, if an unconverted person comes to your service, and they leave feeling good about themselves, who has not been present? God. They might be angry, converted, frustrated, but feeling good about themselves, they've been in the presence of God, it's impossible. But it's when God is present, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, they will fall flat on their faces before him. That's what we want to see corporate worship do. So we want to see people converted. And I encourage everybody in the world, invite your non-Christian friends to worship. Uh, there they'll hear Christ speaking in the scriptures. And there they will see something of the presence of God. And there their hearts might be pierced. You can do other things as well. But we often look at, we have all these halfway houses first. And eventually bring them to, no, worship first. And then the other thing. I just had a question about what you were saying. Worship is covenantal and it's not for the unconverted. <clears throat> and how do we balance that with how we see the pulpit? So um, I guess my question is just thinking about larger catechism, was it 155 and 89, that obviously the, the means that God uses is the reading of the word and the preached right. word, particularly for convincing and humbling sinners. So, well, I'll really just answer that question while you're looking up your question. Well, I, I heard what you said, but I, I guess I want to get maybe a little deeper. And well, it's, it's not a preaching class, but we should always address the unconverted with law and gospel in our sermons. I always do that. Right. But it, the church is a mixed multitude. How do we see that? Um, well, the church is... Not the same kind of mixed multitude. The, the remnant now in the church is the unconverted part, in a faithful church. The remnant in the old covenant church was the faithful part. The remnant now is the unfaithful part. 
So I'm going to address children. I'm going to address uh, hypocrites. I'm going to address visitors uh, uh, in my preaching uh, and uh, in our prayers and, and uh, psalms and hymns. Obviously, they're going to hear who God is. Um, that seems to be the pattern that Paul lays out for us in 1 Corinthians 14. See, I guess I have a hard time thinking that you, you know, you deduce that in the New Testament church the remnant is the unfaithful, right? That's your problem. Well, that's, I suppose, suppose it is. Um, because I think the whole promise of Jeremiah 31 is where it's all turned on its head. God never covenanted in the Old Covenant to write his law upon their hearts. He did it. Right. But now he's covenanted to write his law upon our hearts. And although uh, through credible professions of faith examinations, there we can't see the heart, there will be, but then we are to exercise church discipline. And if a church is faithfully interviewing those that she allows in and exercising church discipline, the remnant is going to be unconverted in a faithful church. So I guess I, I just always think of the state church as the ideal model. Well, that's your problem. That, then you're going to have this, you know, mixed, impure multitude. I, mean, I suppose, I suppose that was a problem for Samuel Rutherford and others. There. It was. <laughs> I'm sorry, we don't play ad hominem games here. Well, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just saying that in, in, in my mind, you know, the perfect church is a state church, which obviously puts me in the extreme minority. But I just, I find it. You know, hard to believe that you're you're going to have in the New Testament church the the vast majority. Well, if you have a state church, you're not, and that's why they've all gone apostate. Well, I mean, I come to one state church that's not going apostate. Well, Doctor Piper, I mean, I suppose I could I could level the same thing and say, just tell me one Christian that hasn't sinned after grace. I mean, it's not what apostasy is. Well, I'm I'm aware of that. I'm saying, but just just because you don't the, the logic or the, I should say the conclusion is not good. That doesn't mean that it voids well, the command. Where is the New Testament pattern for a state church? Well, I, I where is your catechism? Again, you deny your catechism. How am I denying my... Because the catechism says that the visible church is made up of professors and children from all nations. <coughs> right. And then that's the universal Catholic church. And then... Yeah. Churches are divided by state, and you have a state. Where, where are they in the New Testament divided by state? Well, you would see it. They're divided by region, ethnicity, so on. Well, that's because of missionary strategy. Where is the church divided? Well, I think, all I think we have in Jerusalem Council, and all we have in Acts twenty-one is a Jewish church and a Gentile church. That's all we have. Right, but I don't. I don't need the New Testament scriptures to confirm the pattern. Well, you do, because most people will say that the judicial laws were positive laws. Uh, for the sake of preserving the covenant people. And I guess I would say that the judicial laws and general equity hearings over, we should still have a state. They don't church. have, okay. Yeah, but that's, that's why it was a mixed multitude. Right. But there's nothing in the New Testament that implies that church is a mixed multitude. Well, I mean, I, I, I think you could make a strong argument that, that Christ sees the church as a mixed multitude, right? I mean, why do you think you have the wheat and the par or tares parable of the ten virgins? Actually, the wheat and the tares are not just the church. The <clears throat> tares are the people in the world who profess the name of Christ. And we don't go around condemning those who don't for fear that we might be condemning some who are in Christ. You know, it doesn't say church. It says kingdom in the wheat and the tares. And there are going to be the ill-prepared in the church. But again, right. we don't build theology on parables. They're, often, they're all hyperbole. Yeah, but I mean, even Christ says, you know, at the end of Matthew 7, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done... I, I guess I'm just... Well, that's true. But that many, when you take out all of the nations that have professed Christ, there are going to be a lot of hypocrites in the day of judgment. That's right. But that's... I, I guess I just see it fundamentally as a mixed multitude, and, and it may be a greater or lesser ratio. Okay. I think that's how Bannerman would see it. That's fine. That's not how Calvin saw it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My name's going to trump your name. That's all. I'm, 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 I'm a Scottish Presbyterian. I'm just, I'm, I'm laying out what I profess. You're not a to Scottish. Be. You're from the Hollers. Well, it's okay. And you married a Dutch wife who's out of this hyper-Calvinistic background. Actually, she she's went to Apple. She's from the Dutch school. She's from the Dutch state church. I know. 
so that that informed a lot of what I believe about state churches. And where are they today? Well, there's a faithful remnant. Oh, ah, okay. That's all. But Christ promised more than a faithful remnant. Yeah. That's good. We can. This is good discussion. I, I like it. Being that I'm a little more pragmatic than all this, but um, I don't think there has ever been a state. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Whether it's Dutch, English, French, Italian, or whatever, it actually had every citizen of that nation as part of the church at any at any one particular time. So I don't Well, in that. England, you had to you would pay a fine. Well, you would, if you did you not still, go to church on the Sabbath. But still, you had barbarians of various sorts. I mean, they were not even you know invaders. Well, they had to pay a fine though. Scotland and the Netherlands <laughs> collected. In Scotland and the Netherlands, birth was membership in the church. Yeah. yeah. And in my Bible, new births membership in the church. Why? Well, I, I guess it depends on how we define church membership, right? I mean, did that sound Baptist? My? Yeah, church. New oh. birth defines membership? It does. Believe professors and their children. Okay. You finished it. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm okay with an adherent class. Well, you still, an adherence class would affect your preaching, but not your worship, okay? Well, I, I agree. I guess I'm trying to temper preaching more or less. Yeah, but I, wasn't talking about, I was talking about worship. I already said if we preach uh, in a God-centered service, the unconverted are going to be converted. Right. You can, you can get on to me in practicum in the spring about that. I don't want to get on you anything. All right, folks. Very good. Go read all of the reading for tomorrow. It's all short. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.